Housing First has five key principles. Principle number three, recovery orientation. People are more likely to do well and achieve personal goals when they have an opportunity to find their own recovery. Housing First relies on supporting people as they work at their pace towards self-defined goals, whether it's treatment, returning to work, or reconnecting with family. The addition of peer workers on the support team addresses power dynamics, increases safety, and models hope for both participants and team members. Finally, by building, following, and reviewing strength-based recovery plans, the support team can spend less time managing crisis and more time on the steps that lead to the participants' goals for recovery. My mind works differently than your mind, and your mind works differently than Gwen's mind, and everyone has a mental difference. We, there are similarities, of course, but we do have differences, and so I find that it's more empowering for me to just say I have mental differences and this is what it is, instead of saying I'm ill. I, I don't think that it, it necessarily makes me sick. I think it's just something that I have a challenge that I face. And, well-trained people in particular have a very hard time relinquishing all that they've learned about someone with severe mental illness and their ability to function. They have seen it for years as being somehow the same thing. Oh, severely mentally ill can't think for themselves. That's completely untrue. When I think about recovery for myself, um, it's my ability to make decisions for myself and act in a way that's in accordance to have those decisions move forward, um, my ability to act in a way that's in accordance to my values, um, and my ability to be with, be with the world. If you're the type of practitioner who's really wants to only work within your discipline, you feel really attached to that, I think that Housing First might be really frustrating. That was a huge change when I first came in. I was, you know, a new nurse practitioner. I was ready to go out and do primary care. Like, that was what I was going to do. And, um, yeah, it wasn't what the person wanted. And so I had to find a way to figure out what they wanted, as well as um, trying to fit in the value of, of their health. And a lot of people, that's been on the back burner because it's been survival and that requires acknowledgement and recognition that it's not because they didn't want to look after their their health it's because that was the last thing they could look after. I think that the 12-step um, culture has this real hegemonic sort of influence in the social services field even for those of us who don't identify with it it's just there and so I think that it's important for us to deconstruct that, respect people, obviously respect our, we had some participants who were really engaged with 12 steps. Of course, I'm not gonna like criticize that and say, no, that's not the right way to, to, to be or to work with substances, of course. If somebody is practicing abstinence and they're finding the 12 steps helpful, awesome, that's great. But it shouldn't be the only game in town and it certainly shouldn't be something that we're imposing on people in, in our work, especially in a housing first context. Of, you know, recovering from your addiction, you know, there's, there's no correlates between whether you go to treatment or not go to treatment, right? We're evolving, we're changing through our lives. That, that's the same with our mental health and our substance use. And so, you know, walking alongside somebody in their journey, you know, is I think promoting that, that person's recovery in a much more profound way. I remember talking to so many people who had just moved into their places and after they'd been there for about a month, they said, oh my God, I didn't realize how tight my shoulders were. Oh my God, I didn't realize I never really slept. Oh my God, I didn't realize how, how much work I just did day after day after day, keeping body and soul together. I think it's scary when you first get housed and you start to realize it. Because literally everybody will tell you the same thing. It all comes crashing into you, right? Now all of a sudden all your problems are real. There's a period of time where you just have to get used to being in a home. To be honest, I hadn't had my own set of keys in forever. It took me a few months just to kind of have the reality of the situation set in. And once that all kind of got grounded for me, then it was very easy to start looking at the things I needed to improve in my life. There's sort of a view that this population of people don't really have goals or... And I say that's not true at all. You know, everybody had goals and most people had pretty grand goals. Most people 
had goals like going to school, going back to work, you know, regaining custody of children, like pretty significant, big, long-term goals. But the other thing about recovery is sometimes people have goals that you have some difficulties with that you don't quite get with. But I would argue that those are really important goals and you just work with them. This person felt that the real indicator that they had made it, that they were doing well, was to have groceries in their fridge every Friday. Not just on check day, not just once a month. And with that, gave us all kinds of little goals that we could work on. So we didn't talk about the addiction, we didn't talk about taking the antiviral drugs, we didn't talk about any of that stuff. All we talked about is, okay, how, how do we do that? What do we need? But with that came, guess what? Spending more money on groceries, spending less money on drugs. Spending, with that, their health had improved, their diet had improved. So it's amazing how something that may seem so small as having a loaf of bread and peanut butter in your fridge at the end of the week can actually lead and into so many other amazing things that improve your overall health and quality of life. And that for me was a big learning experience to, to sort of stop looking at recovery in terms of you have to be working on this immediate goal that, you know, really um, every little step, if it's a positive step towards wellness, is leading to that overall goal of, of, of recovery. As healthcare professionals, we struggle with addiction. We struggle with mental illness. We struggle with violence in relationships. Um, we struggle with all of the social problems that the folks we're trying to serve struggle with. The problem, the problem being in terms of stigma is that our struggles are not just hidden, they're protected. Um, and that public struggles are really define a person. Um, the point's not for people to be free of struggles. The, point is for people to be free of oppression. There is someone involved with Maine City who, who has had that voice hearing experience and it was so easy for me and her to relate that I didn't have to try and explain what it's like to have derogatory voices telling you that they want to murder you every day. And she understands because she had that experience. And so it, it makes it a safe place right away. And, and with peer support workers the same. It, it, because they've had experiences that are similar, it's easier to open discussion and to trust them. I got quite ill and was hospitalized at one point. And being quite open about that when I got back to the team and letting participants know that that's where I was. Yeah, I ended up in the hospital too. I know what it's like to be the only person in ER wearing the gold pajamas. And it's really lousy. It's really lousy. And if you're not a peer, there's no way you know what that feels like. As a peer worker, I'm there to listen to them and to um, tell, tell them, yeah, I, I can maybe relate. I don't really understand 100% how you feel, but I'm here to tell you that I've been struggling and it's, there's no shame in str struggle. And I understand you have trauma, you're marginalized, you're, discriminated and I hope I can advocate on your behalf or be with you there to make your journey easier. She was a good reflection for me. Um, she helped me be honest with myself about whether I really felt that I was making progress, um, which honestly I had a really hard time with. She had to remind me a lot of the time that I was making progress. Um, you know, for a while just showing up to all my meetings and appointments was a big thing. It didn't feel like a big thing, but it was. Part of the bonus of having peers on the team is it, it really breaks down notions of power over because one of the basis of peer work is to have a reciprocal relationship. I'm learning from someone at the same time they're learning from me. And we talk about that quite openly with the people we're working with. Just the knowledge that there was somebody in the room changed the way that people were engaging and speaking with things. And it wasn't a kind of, you have to be more politically correct now with your language because there's somebody who's going to call you on it. It was just really, we all want to stay true to these kind of principles. And um, there's, there's people around who are going to help, help us do that. And we're really lucky for that. I guess really I thought, again, my intentions of being like, if you just go into this recovery program or you just do this, like it's there, that will be the life-changing thing versus sitting and taking a moment back and being like, what would you like? What, what are you wanting to do? What's meaningful to you? 
I think we make it much more fancier than it needs to be and much more uh, medicalized than it needs to be. It really just needs to, to be what the person's goals are and dreams. And to be able to dream is a recovery and wellness in its own.